Welcome to Northern Lights and Insights. I'm Steve Benson, here with Thomas O'Sullivan, the Curator of Art at the Minnesota Historical Society. Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Today we're going to be talking about the ongoing exhibit, Minnesota Through Artists' Eyes. Well, first of all, many people think of the Historical Society as sort of the state's attic. Uh, what kinds of holdings did you go through to find the paintings for this particular exhibit? Well, we uh, dug pretty deeply in the attic, uh, or the basement would be more apt, since that's where we have much of our museum storage. Uh, the exhibit includes about 60 works, uh, oil paintings, watercolors, a few photographs, and those are drawn from a collection of about 6,000 works of art. And uh, the art collection ranges from the 1840s right up to the present day. So uh, in, in thinking about a landscape exhibit, we were thinking geographically to cover the whole range of the state and also thinking chronologically to cover that time span uh, as our art collection represents it. What are some of the earliest paintings in the uh, state's collection? Well, the, uh, uh, we have quite a few from the 1840s. Uh, the exhibit, in fact, starts with a number of works by an artist who was uh, at Fort Snelling during the 1840s, before the, the uh, establishment of the territory of Minnesota, before the name Minnesota was invented for the territory, in fact. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, works on paper, prints that were made uh, often with a pretty large dose of imagination uh, based on explorers' accounts of what the center of the North American continent looked like. So if you include those, we can think of the 1680s as the earliest time, as uh, European engravers imagined uh, what Minnesota would look like on the basis of the descriptions of early travelers like Jonathan Carver. And of course, today when we think of painting, we think of primarily fine arts, but these mm -hmm. had uh, very practical reasons for coming into existence. Yeah, very much so. Uh, they, were meant, uh, they were meant to tell a story, to, to tell what the place looked like. Uh, they were often meant to, uh, to kind of pique people's curiosity and interest, um, just as maps of the time often kind of filled in some of the blank spots with, uh, uh, with guesswork, if uh, not outright uh, uh, made up creatures and lakes and islands and so forth, uh, artists at the time uh, were, were uh, inclined to kind of exaggerate uh, the height of a waterfall or the, uh, uh, the length of a prairie or something like that. Uh, they were, I think, very, very much aware of their audience as people back in the eastern states, people in Europe who might come upon uh, these pictures in a book or uh, in the 19th century reproduced in a, in a magazine the way that uh, we look at Time magazine for a picture essay today or perhaps even see the paintings as they were toured around in exhibits uh, by the 1870s or 80s when that was a common practice. And some of them, uh, of course, there were these great panoramas that were mm -hmm. shown at fairs or in uh, burlesque places or right. as uh, edification. Right. Yeah, the uh, edification uh, and uh, entertainment, another, uh, another word that was very much a part of that uh, panorama phenomenon. Uh, some, some historians have described the panorama as the motion picture of the mid-19th century, and it did add that element of movement to the scene because uh, it would consist of dozens of scenes on a very large size, maybe eight or nine feet tall and 10 or 15 feet wide, which were sewn together at each edge and then uh, rolled across a stage from side to side while someone usually described as a learned professor would stand in the background and describe the scene that was passing in front of the audience. So. Uh, uh, they were something that uh, people spent their, their hard-earned nickel or dime to see, so they had to be pretty lively as well as uh, informative about the Mississippi Valley, for example, which was the most common subject for panoramas. I also noticed in another exhibit that you had some uh, uh, stereo, stereopticon mm -hmm. uh, pictures that were taken of Minnesota sites and then obviously mm -hmm. sold so that people could view them through those uh, wonderful mm -hmm. devices. Right, right. Uh, virtual reality of, uh, of the 1880s, uh, or as close as they got to it. Uh, uh, a, a picture about this big uh, made of two almost identical scenes mounted side by side on a cardboard. So in the handheld viewer, you could get a really very impressive uh, third dimension um, uh, as, as, your, as your eyes uh, kind of cued your mind into uh, to the depth of a picture. So we did include a few of those in our landscape exhibit to, uh, uh, to give our visitors uh, a sense of, uh, of, of what that third dimension looked like in a way that was a, really popular means to describe these new places like the North Shore. I'm sure there are plenty of those still laying around in people's attics. Oh yes, oh yes, lots of them around and uh, and actually it's something that's uh, you can still find in department stores today in a little bit different form, uh, usually with a plastic viewer and you can put in your scenes of Yosemite or Disney World or wherever so it's, uh, it's a low-tech way of traveling that uh, is still with us. 
Well, let's take a look at the first set of slides that you brought along, Tom. This first slide is uh, one of a number of works by Seth Eastman that are included in the exhibit. Eastman is, uh, was known as a soldier artist during his, uh, during his heyday in the mid-19th century. He was commandant of Fort Snelling in the 1840s, and uh, in that uh, capacity, he was uh, kind of the, the northernmost uh, representative of the United States government and the U.S. Army to the Indian tribes of the area, particularly the Ojibwe and Dakota tribes uh, uh, upstream, downstream from Fort Snelling. Was he a trained artist? That's a great deal of artistic quality to this mm -hmm. as well as simply a record keeping. Well, he was, he was a trained artist as we think of him today, but uh, in that mindset of the 1840s, he was considered to be an amateur because his training came as part of his training at West Point as a military officer. The intention being that uh, uh, an officer needed to be able to, uh, to delineate the look of the landscape where, uh, where an ar his army unit might be operating or to uh, describe the fortifications he was building. And Eastman's work, though, it really goes a few steps beyond that, so we get a real nice sense of atmosphere in the skies and uh, it can really kind of fit together the elements of the landscape, like uh, here the, the fort, uh, so well uh, recognizable that uh, his works were used as documents in the restoration of Fort Snelling in the 1970s. And uh, also just by kind of showing us the everyday scene as he would have known it, kind of cues us into the, the activity around the fort at that time, the idea that this was a meeting place for the Indian nations and the U.S. and travelers. Uh, just look at uh, the elements that are in there aside from the fort. There's a steamboat at the landing and uh, uh, Indians of various tribes uh, commonly gathered there or often to meet with Eastman or to, uh, to meet with each other. So the, the fort was very much a, a kind of a, a, an outpost but also a kind of a, a gathering place for travelers and tourists as well as people there on business. Also noting too that there are almost no trees uh, in this particular vista now is, is right. full of trees so this right. is really the beginning of the prairie. It was the beginning of the prairie then, and in fact, uh, some of his watercolors, which are just a few inches wide, while they show a, a view that makes it look as if you could see for hundreds of miles, uh, he describes them as, uh, as being the prairie in places that we now know are uh, the homes of Richfield or the runways of the airport. One, one of uh, Seth Eastman's visitors at Fort Snelling in the late 1840s was an English-born artist named Henry Lewis. Lewis was based in St. Louis and uh, traveled up the Mississippi to Fort Snelling, intending to uh, start a, a lifelong ambition of making a painting that would show the whole length of the Mississippi River from Fort Snelling, or, or excuse me, even above Fort Snelling, from St. Anthony Falls, which you see in this painting, all the way down to the, uh, to the mouth of the river at New Orleans. Uh, Lewis uh, met Seth Eastman, as many other visiting artists did, uh, Lewis bartered with him to get some of Eastman's drawings to use as uh, some of his raw materials for Lewis's later paintings, and then he outfitted a boat which he used as a traveling studio for his trip down the river. Uh, he eventually uh, painted a panorama, as we were discussing earlier, uh, those uh, huge paintings that were meant to show the whole length of, of the river and uh, began with, with this scene of the Falls of St. Anthony. And while he pointed out uh, the size of the falls and the fact that uh, it was still quite uh, wild and raw as far as settlement goes, he did point out in his narrative about the trip that uh, there were already signs of change there. And uh, there are the, uh, the, the uh, fences in the distance of a settler who's just begun to, to till some fields and also a, a sawmill is a very small feature on one side of the painting. So he was well aware, as uh, other people were at the time, that this was a landscape that was about to, to change drastically. But this still appealed to that sort of aesthetic of the wild, the romantic West. Right. Oh, yes, yes. That's the image that sold then as now. It's a painting done just about 25 years later, and uh, it shows a time when Minnesota was, uh, was becoming a very important uh, producer of wheat. For the, nation's, uh, for the nation's homes and bakeries. But uh, the wheat fields then were along the Mississippi River. This is a painting that was done by Joseph Meeker, another St. Louis-based artist. And uh, uh, Meeker portrayed uh, a field during the time of harvest in 1877. Uh, the field is uh, alongside of Lake Pepin, downstream from uh, Red Wing a ways, near uh, Lake City perhaps. And uh, it shows kind of up to the minute farming for the 1870s. Those haystacks are, are being made by uh, uh, reapers that are traveling through the fields drawn by horses. So we can see the beginning of a pretty heavily mechanized agriculture. Uh, 
We also see a change in the artistic style as Meeker painted out of doors. He was aware of the French Impressionists and their work outdoors to, uh, uh, to make a more spontaneous kind of a painting. And uh, the paintings all sprinkle with wildflowers and lots of suggestions of the natural setting as well as the fields. But of course by picking that bluff area too he gets a rather spectacular uh, background to a wheat right. field. Right. <laughs> Something that in a decade from then uh, you wouldn't find that in the Red River Valley when the, uh, when the farming operations moved. This is where a lot of the wheat was going already by 1888 when Alexis Fournier painted this view of the milling district. St. Anthony Falls, as we saw it, uh, in that painting by Henry Lewis, has here been quite thoroughly tamed and channeled. Uh, dams were built to uh, control the water and to divert it to the turbines of the uh, uh, flour mills and sawmills, which were uh, filling up both sides of the Mississippi in the middle of uh, what we now know as downtown Minneapolis. Uh, you can see the kind of the uh, uh, the effects of that on the natural scene in that uh, it's quite quite uh, dried up. Uh, the water is all being put to use rather than just uh, there for the artist to enjoy the scene. But at the same time, he's really uh, treated those mills in the background kind of the way Meeker treated those bluffs as the, as the uh, very impressive uh, landscape element in itself. And uh, train at the center with that smoke chugging from it. You know, these were the days when that was a sign of progress. So uh, this meant that the landscape was in change and uh, something people were very proud of, that they were putting that river to use. And Fournier was a, was a commercial artist in the sense that he was making his paintings to be sold, not as records as mm -hmm. perhaps Seth Eastman's. Well, he was uh, aiming to make a living at it, uh, certainly. And this is a painting that was done when he was in his early 20s. He was just getting started as a painter, and uh, like, like many young artists then and even today, uh, uh, kind of... Uh, looked to the patronage of uh, local, uh, local families to help him continue his studies and eventually to travel to Europe to uh, really refine his artistic style. So there was a market for this kind of art? There was a growing market and uh, not coincidentally many of the early collectors of works by Minnesota painters were the people who owned those sawmills and those flour mills. So uh, the city's uh, kind, of, kind of cultural uh, uh, habitat was growing at the same time that the that the mills were growing. I know one of your other responsibilities is the uh, collection at the James J. Hill House, and mm -hmm. James J. Hill was a great collector of art, right. mostly again <laughs> European art. Hill is a good example of someone who was uh, looking to to collect the fine art of his day, and that generally meant French painting. And uh, uh, but he also had some connections to an artist like Fournier. Uh, Hill commissioned Fournier to make some paintings of early St. Paul as a way to preserve the look of the young city and also as a way to help Fournier continue his studies. And then Hill made some of his works available to Fournier to, to study the French landscape so a young artist from St. Paul could, uh, could see those, what was considered then to be the height of modern art uh, in the original examples in Hill's home. Like Fournier, Nicholas Brewer, who did this painting of the Blufflands uh, down around uh, Wabasha, Winona area, was also a, Saint, was a Minnesota native as well. Uh, Brewer was based in St. Paul, best known as a portrait painter, and uh, many of his uh, works uh, are in the Minnesota State Capitol, where he portrayed governors of the early 20th century. Uh, he looked at that as his bread and butter work and uh, really uh, uh, hoped for the days when he could spend more time painting out of doors. Uh, a very fine landscape artist who was uh, uh, interested in the Impressionistic movement, interested in painting out of doors and uh, capturing some of that uh, spontaneity of effects of lighting and atmosphere. So that this painting is called Summer Landscape. Uh, other examples in our collection by Brewer include uh, works of that same area that he was very fond of, painted in the fall, painted in the winter, so uh, you could see him uh, somewhat like painters in Europe returning to the same motif during the seasons to uh, get a, a different kind of stimulus from the landscape. How did the Historical Society of Town begin acquiring those early paintings? Well, the uh, collecting of paintings began probably as early as 1850 or so. And the society was founded in 49, and newspaper editorial suggested the society start gathering portraits to uh, preserve the, the faces of the founders of the territory. Uh, over the decades, we've uh, collected works uh, that represent the look of the places in Minnesota, as well as the people. And uh, we continue to collect uh, by donations uh, from collectors or from families uh, who might have some works that they've 
that represent uh, their ancestors or early days in Minnesota. Uh, we occasionally purchase some works for the art collection or uh, arrange with a collector to borrow works for exhibits and then for future bequests of works. Of course, the new History Center is a marvelous place to uh, display paintings mm -hmm. and photographs and artifacts, but also presumably to preserve them. Yes, yes, that's a really important part of the History Center from its inception, and uh, it's the kind of the, the invisible part of uh, uh, the building. Way down below, uh, uh, below ground level where a visitor comes into the building, we have very carefully climate-controlled storage rooms and uh, laboratories for cataloging, restoration, and photography of artworks and all kinds of collections. And also uh, displaying, I noticed, particularly the Seth Eastmans were under very controlled light conditions. Mm -hmm. Right, right. An important part of uh, making sure that they're around in 100 years from now uh, by controlling the lighting, a very elaborate um, environmental filtering system all through the building to uh, uh, not just keep temperature and relative humidity stable, but also to, uh, to filter out impurities from the freeways, for example. And presumably you must have to go and uh, touch up or at least take care of the paintings that are other sites. I'm thinking of those right. wonderful battle paintings that are up at the state capitol. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that, uh, that's a, an ongoing part of, uh, of the work of the society for all the collections. The uh, paintings at the state capitol showing Civil War battles have uh, in most cases been restored in the past 10 years or so and recently re-photographed in late 1994 and reproduced as posters. And uh, that's part of the way we, we look at the preservation and then the exhibition and then making them available to the public through things like our prints and books and so forth. And then, of course, you have many works that are scattered around the state at various mm -hmm. sites. Right, right. Uh, we have uh, a couple of dozen sites that are all over the state from, uh, from the Canadian border to the Iowa border and everywhere in between. And uh, in many of those cases, there are artworks that were owned by the family who lived in a house, for example, like the Ramsey House in St. Paul. And they represent not just the Ramsey family, but also the taste of the time. So uh, in those instances, the, uh, the artworks are really kind of part of the soul of those sites because they're, they're the things that were on the walls when the Ramsey family lived there. And they help us explain to people who, what the family looked like, what they surrounded themselves with. One of my favorite periods in art is the whole WPA period when mm -hmm. uh, art sort of met culture and right. politics. Right. Let's take a look at that right. set. This is a painting by Bennett Swanson, an artist based in St. Paul, who uh, was a very prolific member of the WPA's Federal Art Project, and I think of it as a, a good example of what artists were trying to do on that project. They were paid with uh, federal relief funds to make a kind of a collective portrait of what Minnesota looked like, but they had a lot of leeway within that. So in painting St. Paul, which we can identify by oh, the river valley in the background and the high bridge up in the upper right-hand corner, uh, Swanson also, I think, wanted to tell a bit, little bit of a story about the times. So he made the, uh, uh, the old mansion falling down in the foreground and that line of shadowy figures in the background, a real prominent part of the painting, as if to suggest the really dreary and kind of tragic times uh, for a lot of people of the Great Depression. So in that sense, they were also kind of commenting on society as well as just picturing what they saw around them. So that political as well as the artistic. Very much so, uh, a, a really activist time for artists on the political scene. A few years later, another artist from central Minnesota named Adolf Dane returned home uh, to uh, the Waterville area from his studio in New York City and uh, did a series of paintings and prints of farms in southern Minnesota. Uh, Dane was uh, someone who kind of kept that affection for Minnesota all through his life as he traveled around the world in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, he really kind of suggested some of that affection for the farmlands where he grew up in paintings like this one called Autumn in Minnesota. And uh, I think an interesting comparison in its style to that uh, scene of the harvest in the 1870s that we saw in that earlier sequence of slides. This is a still the same kind of thing you can see out of the car window. Oh, yes. Yep, and uh, in some of his paintings you see cars and roads start to show up too. So we can look at these paintings not just artistically, but as things that show the changing historical scene. This painting by Josephine Lutz Rollins suggests changes in art and in history real well, I think. Uh, she, it's a painting called Open Pit Mine from the 1950s, and uh, really shows the impact of modern art, of abstract expressionist painting, on the work that artists were doing, even when they were painting the landscape. 
Uh, they weren't concerned with making a very realistic view like Fournier was or like Lewis was a hundred years before them. They were interested in kind of showing some of their emotion in front of, in front of a place. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if we think of the size and the scale of an open pit mine, Rollins suggested by showing those, uh, those cranes and buildings as just little tiny details, but really kind of give some sense of the huge size of the mines by these big wide sweeps of paint and really kind of garish colors to suggest uh, her response to, uh, to the way that the mines sort of laid open the whole interior of the earth. And even though it is a scar, it's still very beautiful, so there is a strong aesthetic content to this painting. Yeah, yeah, very much so. She was interested in making a thing of beauty that uh, showed a, a very 20th century, very modern kind of beauty as well. Not just a pretty scene, but something that kind of kind of grabbed, grabbed somebody. And we, we do have works that come right up to the present day in the show. This is a, a uh, not a painting, but a collage made of, uh, made of uh, found and, uh, and carved wooden pieces. Driftwood from Lake Superior? Driftwood in many cases, uh, and it's by George Morrison. Uh, Morrison grew up on the shore of Lake Superior and then went off to art school in Duluth and Minneapolis and New York City and traveled the world uh, as, a, as quite a well-known uh, abstract painter in the 1950s and 60s. And coming back to get in touch with his, uh, with his Native American roots. Yes, yes. Uh, he got in touch with his, uh, his roots uh, on the Grand Portage Reservation where he grew up and uh, has a studio there today in the 1990s. And he, he assembles these collages. This one is eight feet wide out of many small pieces of wood that r literally come to him from the lake, not just as inspiration, but the materials. And then he works in a very strong horizon line, in this case, almost toward the top of the picture to suggest the feeling of uh, the place where the, sky, where the sky meets the waters in the distance. It was really fun to watch a group of uh, kids look at this particular work and looking at all the tiny pieces, many almost mm -hmm. like blocks. Yes, yeah, and it does. I think for the kid and all of us, it suggests blocks and jigsaw puzzles. And, you know, we think of it, uh, think of finding it in the middle of a series of landscape pictures, and it maybe suggests a different idea to mind. And I hope that's something that visitors do. They think, well, how is this a landscape? And start to realize that some of these natural forms can also uh, give some sense of, uh, uh, of the outdoors along Lake Superior. As well as an interior landscape. Right. Uh, one that the artist has projected from his own experience, very much so, and then tried to give to us to make it part of our, our interior landscapes. And one final selection of uh, the slides we have here today. This is the most recent painting in the, uh, in the exhibit by a Minneapolis artist named Doug Argue, and he calls it the Buffalo Painting. And it's about uh, the size of a billboard. It's 20 feet wide, and uh, I think uh, you really need that size to get the full impact of what he's saying because while well, he's shown a, a prairie landscape as he knew growing up on the prairies, uh, uh, it's covered with the carcasses of buffaloes. Uh, his own experiences as a boy in the landscape were kind of combined with his history classes as a, as a grade school child and then his later uh, learning about uh, changes in American history and he decided to make a 19th century style painting that would be, as I say, as big as a billboard but uh, rather than glorify something like a war or a king or a president, would rather use it to call our attention to a great change on the landscape and the slaughter of the buffalo, the changing of the way of life and the whole environment that that, that, that entailed in the 19th century. And two, the, the aesthetic qualities, again, that, that very strange and threatening sky. Right. It's a weird, he describes it as a Georgia O'Keeffe sky, a, a strange light that's... Uh, uh, that's meant to, like, like the buffalo carcasses themselves, you know, keep us pretty uneasy at the thought of what has happened in the landscape. But at the same time, he said he wanted to make it a beautiful painting, so he uh, used very traditional techniques and materials, and all of, even all the buffalo carcasses are uh, just kind of surrounded with prairie grasses waving in the breeze to suggest that there's some rebirth in the cycle of nature. And also, just from uh, the historical society's perspective, presumably bringing this back to the very roots of the state. Right, yeah, very much so. Uh, bring it back outdoors, bring it back to uh, the places where history has happened, one of our slogans uh, in the historical society, and to also to show how uh, the, the events of the past and awareness of them is, uh, is a really important part of present-day artists' thinking. Tom, those are wonderful examples of the more permanent part of this exhibit, but also there's counterpoints, which is a changing part. Right. We, uh, we wanted to have a kind of a seasonal change within the exhibit, in a sense. Uh, 
and uh, in part to bring in the work of contemporary artists and uh, the artist community around the state, uh, but also to, uh, to make it clear to visitors that this is an ongoing art form, that even though, even though uh, the sign on the door says History Center, it's not all old stuff. This is a uh, continuing artistic phenomenon. So we uh, have a series of solo exhibits for artists from different parts of the state, each of them running for about four months until the end of our exhibit. Uh, Gladys Kosky Holmes, for example, a painter from the Iron Range, has a series of works about the place on the range where she and her family have their roots. We will have uh, works by Jerry Mathiason, a photographer in kind of the Ansel Adams black and white photography tradition, showing a uh, family farmstead on uh, the Canadian border in Lake of the Woods County. A series of paintings and pastels will be third, uh, works by Karen Savage Blue, an Ojibwe artist from Cloquet, who has a very strong kind of nature presence in her work. And then the fourth of the artists we've invited as counterpoints to our standing exhibit will be Wayne Meineke, an artist based in Edina, who is uh, very well known nationally as a wildlife painter, but also uh, has done a lot of works of, shall we say, urban wildlife, uh, city scenes around Minneapolis and St. Paul. This exhibit will be running now through uh, 1996, but presumably uh, it'll have a life far into the future. Well, I hope uh, it's something that we'll continue to do in the future. While this show closes in spring of 96, uh, we've got a uh, couple thousand more pictures that I hope to be able to draw from the basement for future shows. The uh, photographic element, again, must be one of the more mm -hmm. difficult things. You must have, uh, if you have hundreds of paintings, you must have thousands upon thousands of photographs. Right hundreds of thousands to be exact and uh, and that actually was the hardest thing about the whole show how to narrow it down to 60 or so pieces that will fit in the space available at the time when people begin to go through their attics perhaps their basements or maybe even the walls of uh, dining rooms uh, what should they be looking at in terms of what value this might have to the state well, one of the uh, key elements, as simple as it sounds, is that all of our collections relate to Minnesota, so that uh, we're interested in works that represent Minnesota subjects, like the landscapes we've seen, or are by Minnesota artists. And uh, through that combination of the artist's own life uh, history and the work that uh, the artist has done, we kind of contribute to our mission of telling Minnesota stories. Tom, thank you very much for joining us today. Tom O'Sullivan is Curator of Art at the Minnesota Historical Society. I'm Steve Benson for Northern Lights and Insights. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency.